Hey everyone, Nigel and Luke here, and welcome to Crime Zone. If you're like us, then you probably remember being told as a child that you should always respect your elders. While the sentiment is understandable, there are of course always exceptions. Today, we wanted to take a look at a few cases where older definitely did not mean wiser. Just before we get to today's stories, a reminder that if you find our videos interesting and informative, to like and subscribe for more true crime content like this. It really helps us to continue building the channel, and if you've watched a few of our videos already, you might not even realize that you're not subscribed. While you're there, don't forget to hit the notification bell to stay up to date with our latest releases. With that out of the way, let's get to the video. Before the spring of 2012, most people in Craig County, Oklahoma, likely didn't pay too much attention to 73-year-old Darlene Mays. A retired Department of Human Services worker, Darlene lived what appeared to be a quiet life just a few miles outside of the small city of Veneta. However, Darlene's image would be forever changed in the minds of both locals and law enforcement in April of that year when investigators in Craig County uncovered the 73-year-old's surprising secret. She was reportedly the kingpin of one of the area's largest illegal marijuana dealing operations. When police raided Darlene's home on the night of April 10th, 2012, the whole place allegedly reeked of the drug, and more than four pounds of it was soon found inside. Also recovered were two handguns and nearly $277,000 in cash. The cash was reportedly bundled and hidden in numerous places around the residence, in unsealed vacuum bags under a bed, in the closet, and in the back seat of a vehicle on the property. According to articles written at the time, a large amount of cash was even found on Darlene's person. Despite essentially being caught red-handed, the 73-year-old apparently claimed that the money was all hers and that it had been obtained legally for her retirement. However, Investigators didn't buy this story. It turned out that while police had been investigating Darlene's operation for months, they had finally been able to obtain a search warrant for her property after her own son snitched on her. The son, Jerry Van Dorsey, had been arrested the day before carrying two pounds of weed and thousands of dollars in cash. In fact, he told investigators that he had stolen both the drugs and cash from his mother's house. According to Jerry, he had originally helped Darlene get into the marijuana business, introducing her to some contacts in Arizona from whom she obtained her drugs. Darlene had allegedly grown the operation to the point where investigators believed that she controlled 40% of the local market, with her territory including Tulsa, as well as parts of Arkansas, Kansas, and Missouri. Jerry said that the relationship between him and his mother soured because of his meth use, which caused her to cut him out of the business. He said that he robbed her home of the money and drugs while she was at a doctor's appointment because he was mad about being cut out, and also said that Darlene had cheated him out of a horse trailer. At the time of the raid on her house, Darlene was arrested and was subsequently slapped with numerous charges, including possession with intent to distribute and multiple counts of possession of a firearm while in the commission of a felony. According to reports, though, it was ultimately Darlene who would get the last laugh, as the following year, a judge tossed all of the charges against her during a preliminary hearing. Her lawyers were able to successfully argue that Jerry was the actual mastermind behind the drug operation, and that there was insufficient evidence tying Darlene to the crime. Instead, Jerry ended up pleading guilty to possession of a controlled substance with intent to distribute for the drugs that he was originally caught with and received a 15-year suspended sentence. Though prosecutors vowed to appeal the case against Darlene at the time the charges against her were thrown out, it appears that they were unsuccessful, as this was the last available information we could find about the case. As the old saying goes, it's never too late to switch careers. As this next chilling story proves, that's unfortunately true, even if the new business is murder. Ray Copeland was born in 1914 in Oklahoma. Though his family was never really wealthy to begin with and moved around constantly during his childhood, 
Things became even more difficult when Ray was a teenager with the start of the Great Depression. He eventually dropped out of school and began trying to get money any way he could. Unsatisfied with the abysmal wages that were available at the time, Ray quickly turned to a life of crime. He began by stealing livestock and forging checks, but eventually moved on to a slightly more sophisticated scheme that combined the two offenses. Essentially, he would go to a cattle auction, write a fraudulent check, and then sell the cattle before the person he got them from found out. If all went well, Ray would have skipped town with his money by the time police got involved. Unfortunately for Ray, he wasn't exactly a brilliant con man, and this, combined with the fact that he rarely changed up his scheme, meant that after a little while, he always managed to get himself caught and thrown in jail. After one such stint in 1940, Ray was released and met a woman named Faye Wilson. The two had a brief courtship, but quickly married, and soon after began to have a number of children. With the family rapidly growing, money was tight, and Ray found himself moving him, his wife, and his children all across the country the same way his parents had when he was a kid. Throughout this time, he continued to run his cattle scams and was caught numerous time and sentenced to short terms in jail. Finally, in the middle of the 1960s, Ray came up with a variation of his scheme that he thought would be more successful. This was partly so that he and his family could settle down for good, but also partly out of necessity as he had been banned from many cattle auctions and was notorious for fraud in several places around the country. In 1967, Ray and Faye purchased a farm in Mooresville, Missouri, where they planned to put down permanent roots. Soon after, they began to employ vagrants and drifters to be their farmhands. Now, rather than going to livestock auctions himself, Ray would send the unknown farmhands instead, who would pass off his fraudulent checks on his behalf. Once Ray had the livestock, the scheme would work just as before. He would sell the animals off and get his money before anyone realized what had happened. On occasions where the checks were traced back to Ray, he would simply claim that they had been forged by one of his unknown farmhands, who by that time would have left town after being fired by Ray. Though this scam was much more successful than Ray's previous crimes, eventually the scheme was exposed, and once again he was sent to prison this time for a lengthier stay. While you might think that this would finally be the point at which Ray would learn his lesson, that was not the case. In fact, in his mind, the only problem with his plan was that the drifters he had hired as farmhands could still be tracked down and give evidence against him. He decided that when he got out of jail this time, he wasn't going to leave behind any witnesses. After all, he was now nearly in his 70s and wanted to avoid going back to jail at all costs. While Ray continued to be an unpopular presence around town in the eyes of his neighbors, for years things remained relatively quiet at the Copeland property. That was until late 1989 when police received a disturbing tip from a man named Jack McCormick. According to Jack, he had been hired to work as a farmhand on Ray and Faye Copeland's property in Mooresville, and during his time there, Ray had tried to kill him. He didn't think he was the first either as he had seen what he believed were bones scattered around the farm. Given Ray's criminal track record, police obtained a search warrant for his property. The investigation was initially slow, but authorities were persistent, and soon they uncovered something truly horrific. The remains of five men buried in shallow graves throughout the farm. Autopsies would reveal that all of them had been shot in the back of the head at close range. When detectives did some more searching, they found a 22 caliber bolt-action rifle in the Copeland home, which they determined was the same weapon that had been used to shoot the five men. They also found a sort of ledger written in Faye's handwriting with the names of farmhands who had worked at the Copeland property for the last few years. This was used to uncover the name of the five victims found on the property. They were later identified as Dennis K. Murphy, Wayne Warner, Jimmy Dale Harvey, John W. Freeman, and Paul J. Coward. Disturbingly, X's had been written next to the names of all of these men on the ledger, but they weren't the only ones. A further seven names were marked this way on the list, though no trace of them was ever found. Perhaps most chilling of all, investigators would make one final discovery in the Copeland home during their search. 
It was a quilt that had allegedly been sewn out of the victim's clothing. While Ray was immediately charged in connection with the five murders, investigators were initially more sympathetic to Faye. They believed that she had to have been somewhat involved in the crimes, though offered to charge her with conspiracy to commit murder if she provided them with information about the location of the other seven suspected victims. This would have meant minimal prison time compared to a potential death sentence. However, Faye claimed that she not only had no involvement in the murders, but that she had no knowledge of the crimes entirely. As a result, she was charged with the same crimes as her husband. While this was going on, Ray tried unsuccessfully to plead insanity before changing his tune and trying to work out a plea deal with prosecutors. They refused, and he was charged with five counts of first-degree murder. Faye was the first to go to trial in November of 1990, with her defense arguing that she had been forced to go along with her husband's actions because he was violent and abusive towards her. A jury disagreed, and Faye was given the death penalty. When Ray was told about the outcome of his wife's trial, he reportedly replied, quote, Well, those things happen to some, you know? Ray himself would fare no better at trial, and in 1991, he was also sentenced to death. At the time, he was 76 and Faye was 69, making them the oldest couple ever to be sentenced to death in the United States. Ray would die on death row just two years after his conviction in 1993. Faye eventually had her sentence commuted to life in prison on the grounds that she had been abused by her husband, though would remain in jail until the fall of 2002 when she was given compassionate release after suffering a stroke. She died at a nursing home in Missouri at the age of 82. To this day, the remains of the Copeland's other suspected victims have yet to be recovered. In the spring of 2009, residents and business owners in the Japanese city of Higashi, Osaka began to be victimized by a wave of burglaries. Each time, the culprit would strike under the cover of darkness, making off with hundreds or even thousands of dollars worth of stolen cash, valuables, and merchandise. Though police were able to link many of these crimes to a single perpetrator, much to their dismay, they soon realized that they were dealing with a true professional. He was athletic and displayed great physical abilities, squeezing through tight spaces and effortlessly running and jumping along walls to avoid being seen on the streets. On the rare occasion that the suspect was captured by surveillance cameras, the footage proved to be of little value to police. The suspect was dressed head to toe in black and his face was covered. All police could do was guess that based on the burglar's athleticism, general size, and attributes, that they were looking for a young man. The mysterious thief was dubbed the Ninja of Heisei, apparently named after the current era in Japanese history at the time. Police remained vigilant as they received more and more reports about burglaries committed by the suspect, but to their frustration, he continued to strike with impunity. For more than eight years, the ninja of Heisei eluded police, until finally, in July of 2017, he made what appeared to be his first critical mistake while burglarizing an electronics store. He was captured on CCTV with his mask lowered, giving authorities their first look at his face. To their surprise, the suspect was older than they had thought. Quite a bit older. Based on this footage, over the next couple of months, police were able to retrace the man's steps and identify him. It turned out that he was a 74-year-old named Mitsuaki Tanagawa. During their surveillance, investigators learned that during the day, Tanagawa was indistinguishable from other elderly men his age. However, sometime before nightfall, he would leave his residence, walk to an abandoned apartment building, and change into his ninja-like outfit, waiting for it to get dark before he headed out to commit burglaries. Once he was done, he would return to the same abandoned building, where he would change back into his street clothes, allowing him to blend right back into the community like any normal senior citizen. Tanagawa was arrested in October of 2017 and charged with stealing roughly $230 from the electronics store where he was caught on surveillance video without his face covered. According to reports, upon being arrested, he said, I am defeated. 
adding that if he were younger, he wouldn't have been caught. He said that the motive behind his crimes were simple. He didn't want to work, and theft was quicker. Though articles written about Tanagawa at the time mentioned that more charges would likely be brought against him, it's unclear what happened to him from here, as this is where information about the case drops off in the public record. It's estimated that between 2009 and 2017, he committed somewhere between 200 and 250 burglaries, making off with more than $260,000 worth of cash, valuables, and stolen goods. Though this next story rates pretty low on the severity scale as far as crime goes, we decided to include it because of just how ridiculously juvenile the whole thing was. In fact, you'd be forgiven for forgetting that the people involved weren't actually teenagers. Before the spring of 2014, the Carlisle was just like any other retirement community in Abbotsford, British Columbia, at least as far as the public was concerned. The condo complex was built in 1989 and consisted of 42 different units overseen by a property management company called Campbell Strata. Within real estate circles, the Carlisle was well regarded as a good place to live. It had good amenities, was a relatively newer build, and was centrally located, a convenient walk for many local businesses, as well as the nearby Seven Oaks shopping center. It was also relatively affordable compared to many places in BC's out of control real estate market. However, that year, the Carlisle would become known for something that had nothing to do with the building itself, when it was revealed that it had been the scene of a multi-year legal battle due to a bizarre ongoing feud between several of its elderly residents. It all started in September of 2009, when a man named Brian Shantz and his wife Jean Gorman moved into the Carlisle's Suite 203. Like all of the other residents there, Brian was well above the building's 55-year age minimum. However, his wife, Jean, was not. Unfortunately, even the court records we came across while researching this story didn't mention exactly how old Brian was, though it's safe to assume, based on the ages of everyone else in this story, that he was likely in his 70s. Jean was only 42. If you're like us, then you're probably thinking that this should have been a relatively minor issue. Sure. Maybe Jean was below the building's minimum age, but her husband wasn't. No big deal, right? However, apparently this was a big deal to some of the other residents, who allegedly made it known that they were not happy about the situation. To make matters worse, rather than simply talking things out with their new neighbors, it would soon become clear that Brian and Jean were more than willing to escalate the hostilities. Over the next couple of years, things essentially devolved into a petty turf war. While it's nearly impossible to discern who started what, since the court records are just an endless string of mutual accusations, what we know for sure is some frankly bananas stuff went down at the Carlisle between the fall of 2009 and when the story made the news in the spring of 2014. Much of it seems to have transpired specifically between Brian and Jean and the condo council president, 77-year-old Tarek Bullion. Brian and Jean claimed that they had been the victims of a sustained campaign of harassment at the Carlisle. Their car was spray-painted with words like rat, pig, and cow. Jean's motorized scooter was tampered with. One condo council member allegedly shot a flare at Jean's car as she was driving out of the complex, and another elderly resident allegedly hid under a blanket in the back seat of a vehicle to take so-called surveillance photos of her. Jean claimed that Tarek Bullion had threatened her by making a slashing motion across his throat while walking past her, and that her thumb had been dislocated when she was attacked by two male residents in one of the building's hallways. The couple also claimed they received a note on Christmas Day that included a link to a website about how to take your own life. For his part, Tarek Bullion, as well as multiple other residents and members of the condo council, claimed that all of this was par for the course, as Brian and Jean had been the true aggressors at the Carlisle. They were accused of things including, but not limited to, breaking chairs in the recreation area, removing doorknobs from the exercise room, punching holes in walls, purposely driving into the parking garage security gates, spraying people's car windshields with oil, 
cutting alarm wires, making prank phone calls to residents in the middle of the night, repeatedly opening and closing the parking garage gates in the middle of the night to keep people up, stalking and threatening members of the condo council with bear spray, and throwing eggs at people's cars. As if these accusations weren't insane enough, Brian allegedly had an affair with Tarek Bullion's wife during all of this, and at one point wrote detailed letters about the affair which he posted on the couple's door. While some of these incidents resulted in criminal charges against Brian, Jean, and other residents for offenses including harassment, assault, and mischief, most of the legal battles at the Carlisle were civil in nature. In an article from 2014, a writer for the National Post stated that he was aware of at least 12 different lawsuits concerning incidents at the Carlisle that had been filed by Brian and Jean alone. The vast majority of these were apparently thrown out by exasperated judges, who, needless to say, were not impressed by the behavior of any of the parties involved. One particularly annoyed judge, Robert Hamilton, was quoted as saying about the residents of the Carlisle, quote, one would expect to find emotional children who have not yet learned the basic tenets of acting civilly towards each other, not senior citizens. While it's unclear just how long the legal battles at the Carlisle lasted for, apparently at the time the story broke in 2014, Brian and Jean still owned their unit there, but had since moved out. Though unfortunately this is the most current information we could find about the case, Perhaps on the bright side, this means that in the years since, life has returned to normal for those at the Carlisle who simply moved there to enjoy their retirements. On November 8, 1999, the LAPD received a 911 call about a suspected hit and run near North La Brea Avenue and Beverly Boulevard. The victim was an elderly man who was found lying in an alleyway. He would later be identified as a 73-year-old Hungarian immigrant named Paul Vados. When officers arrived at the location, they were struck by the oddity of the scene. Paul was obviously dead, but based on his injuries, it didn't look as though he had been standing or walking when he had been hit. Instead, it appeared that he had been lying down and hadn't tried to prevent the vehicle that had killed him from running over him. Despite this bizarre detail, when investigators uncovered Paul's identity and found out that he was homeless, they concluded that he must have been passed out in the alleyway when he was hit by the car. This conclusion persisted, even after an autopsy found no drugs or alcohol in the 73-year-old system. At the time police figured out who Paul was, they discovered that he had been reported missing by his fiance and his cousin. The fiance came to collect Paul's remains from the morgue, and later on, his cousin came to the police station and requested his death certificate. Neither of the women seemed particularly troubled by Paul's death. Though with no surveillance footage in the area and no witnesses to the crime, investigators had little to go on in terms of solving his murder. Soon, the case slipped away into quiet obscurity. Roughly six years later, in June of 2005, the LAPD received a 911 call with strikingly similar details. A homeless man had been struck and killed by a car in an alleyway, but when officers went to investigate, it appeared that the man hadn't been sitting or standing at the time of his death. Instead, he had been lying down, and his chest and skull had been seriously fractured. He also had grease marks on his clothing, which police believed had been from the underside of the vehicle that had run him over. Once again, investigators concluded that the victim was likely passed out in the alleyway at the time he had been killed though this time the man's autopsy did return traces of drugs and alcohol in his system. In particular, the sedative Zolpidem was found, as well as the opioid hydrocodone. Thanks to ID cards found with the man's body, he was quickly identified as 50-year-old Kenneth McDavid. Thankfully, there was at least one major clue for investigators to go on in Kenneth's case. A surveillance camera from a store near the crime scene had captured a vehicle driving down the alley where Kenneth was killed. The vehicle had stopped in the alley, all of its lights had turned off for a few minutes, and then it had turned back on and driven away. It was identified as either a Ford Taurus or a Mercury Sable station wagon. When police began to look into Kenneth's last known address, they were led to an apartment building where the manager informed police that the 50-year-old hadn't lived there for some time. 
he had been unemployed and had been unable to pay his rent. However, the manager was fairly certain that he knew where Kenneth had gone next. Apparently, he had been taken in by a kind older woman who was connected to a local Presbyterian church. At roughly the same time that all of this was happening, an investigator named Ed Webster, who worked for an insurance company called Mutual of New York, was looking into claims made on two life insurance policies that had stood out to him. The policies totaled $1 million and were both for Kenneth McDavid. Because the policies on Kenneth's life were less than two years old, it had apparently triggered an automatic investigation, and Ed was starting to notice red flags. Almost all of the information provided on the policies was turning out to be false. The beneficiaries of the policies were supposed to be two women who identified themselves as Kenneth's fiancé and cousin. However, when Ed looked into the police reports about his death, he discovered that these women had told investigators that they were his business partners. When Ed tried reaching out to the women and was stonewalled, he instead went to the police. In an amazing stroke of luck, when Ed was discussing his findings with one of the people investigating Kenneth's case, it just so happened that they were overheard by another detective. He said that the details of Kenneth's case sounded really familiar, and after doing some digging, pulled out an old file. It was the unsolved Paul Vados case. This is when the first pieces started falling together. It turned out that the so-called fiancé and cousin that were the beneficiaries of Kenneth's life insurance policies were the same women who had claimed Paul's body and death certificate back in 1999. Their names were Helen Gallet and Olga Ruderschmidt. Both of the women were in their 70s. Not only that, but Helen was the supposedly kind old lady who had taken Kenneth in when he had fallen on hard times. When detectives started digging further, they soon discovered that the life insurance policies at Mutual of New York were just the tip of the iceberg. In fact, the women had taken out more than 20 life insurance policies on Kenneth and Paul before their deaths. As investigators continued to follow the evidence, they were led to the Hollywood Presbyterian Church. When they asked the pastor there about Helen and Olga, he said that they were wonderful women who had been with the church since 1997. In particular, they had taken an interest in the church's programs which provided meals to the homeless. In fact, they had even gone above and beyond. Helen was involved in real estate and used some of the property she owned to provide housing to those in need. The Presbyterian Church is where the women had come across both Paul Vados and Kenneth McDavid. For detectives, it seemed that even more pieces of their investigation were now falling into place. They were now almost positive that Helen and Olga were behind both of the men's murders and that they had committed the crimes in order to collect as much money as possible from the many life insurance policies that they had taken out on them. Disturbingly, while police were in the midst of investigating the two women, they discovered that they appeared to be courting a new victim. Feeling they had limited time to act before something else terrible happened, police arrested Helen and Olga on mail fraud charges linked to the falsified life insurance documents in May of 2006. Though detectives didn't yet have enough to get them on murder, that evidence would come soon enough when they conducted a search of the women's houses. It turned out that Helen in particular kept extensive records, and when investigators looked through her home, they found documents linking her to Paul, Kenneth, and a third man named Fred Downey. Fred had been in his late 90s when he agreed to relocate from his home in Massachusetts to the Los Angeles area so that Helen could take care of him. Evidence would show that Helen had taken control of his financial assets and home, draining his bank accounts before Fred was mysteriously struck and killed by a car in November of 2000. That case was ruled an accident. In addition to these records, detectives found rubber stamps that had been made of Paul and Kenneth's signatures for the purposes of signing documents, as well as a stolen driver's license. They also found significant quantities of the drugs Zolpidem and Hydrocodone, the same substances that had been found in Kenneth's system at the time of his death. Perhaps most damning of all was a partial vehicle identification number and license plate number that police found in Helen's home that belonged to a 1999 Mercury Sable station wagon. Further investigation would reveal that on the night of Kenneth's death, Helen had called AAA to have the vehicle towed less than a block away from the crime scene. 
The vehicle had been brought to Helen's house, then abandoned a short distance away, before it was eventually impounded. Amazingly, police were able to track the vehicle down, and when they performed a thorough examination of it, they found that blood was still on its underside. The blood came back as a match to Kenneth. Unbelievably, there were still more dark details yet to come, though, as when news of Helen and Olga's arrests were reported, it prompted a man named Jimmy Covington to come forward. What he told police was truly disturbing. Jimmy claimed that back in the early 2000s, when he had been homeless, he had been approached by Olga Rutterschmidt. She took him out for a meal and promised him a place to stay as well as further assistance if he agreed to fill out a few forms. Olga described the situation as a sort of program that she and her friend Helen ran to help get down on their luck men back on their feet. However, shortly after Jimmy accepted the offer, he noticed that the two women wanted an unusual amount of personal information from him. They started out by requesting relatively minor things like his date of birth, but soon moved on to things like his social security number, and even wanted to know personal details about his family. Weirded out and feeling suspicious about the whole thing, Jimmy decided to decline the women's offer of help and went on his way. Little did he know that by then, they had already taken out two life insurance policies on him. It turned out that this was precisely what Olga and Helen had done to Paul and Kenneth, though neither of them had caught on to the dark scheme. For roughly two years in both of these cases, the men had lived at one of Helen's properties, believing that she and Olga merely wanted to help them get off the streets. However, the entire time, the women had merely been racking up as many life insurance policies as they could on them, until the time was right to stage their deaths and collect the cash. As if the evidence against them wasn't strong enough, Olga and Helen apparently incriminated themselves almost the moment they were taken into custody. After refusing to talk to detectives, they were left in a room together where they were unaware that they were being recorded. Olga immediately started berating Helen and calling her greedy, saying that she shouldn't have taken out so many insurance policies. Police would come to learn over the course of their investigation that despite spending so much time together, the women were not even particularly friendly to one another. Instead, they had been drawn to each other by their mutual desire for easy money. In the spring of 2008, Helen and Olga were each found guilty of the first-degree murder of Paul Vados, as well as conspiracy to murder him and Kenneth McDavid. Only Helen was found guilty of the first-degree murder of Kenneth, though. Both were sentenced to consecutive life terms in prison without the possibility of parole. At the time, Helen was 78 and Olga was 75. Unfortunately, neither woman was charged in connection with Fred Downey's murder. His story is particularly heartbreaking because it was clear how much he loved and trusted Helen. In fact, according to reports we came across, he purchased gravestones for her and her daughter so that when they passed away, they could be buried next to him. Based on Fred's case and the information that Jimmy Covington provided, it seems possible that Helen and Olga had other unlucky victims whose murders have yet to be discovered. At the time of this recording, both women remain alive and incarcerated. Helen Golay is 91 years old, while Olga Rutterschmidt is 89. Before we wrap up today's video, we just wanted to take a second of your time to ask for a little bit of feedback. You may have noticed that this is the first list-style multi-case video we've done in a while for our midweek release, as recently, we started doing more in-depth looks at single cases. Basically, we just want to know which format you all prefer. Do you like hearing about several stories built around a theme? A more thorough dive into a specific case? Or do you like both? and appreciate it when we kind of just do a mix of each. We want to hear from you, so be sure to tell us in the comments section below. As always, don't forget to let us know if there are other stories like this that you've heard of that you think we missed, or additional story ideas that you want to send our way. With that said, take care, and thank you for watching.